So if you're watching this video, I bet you've played Dungeons & Dragons before. You nerd. But maybe you haven't, but I'm sure you have friends who have, because this is the internet. Now, D&D &D is pretty much cultural shorthand for the geekiest thing ever, but the story behind it is quintessentially American. Uh, Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax and everyone else at TSR were inventors, and they cobbled together bits and pieces of other tactical war games to create something entirely new and pretty much invented the whole role-playing game industry. And as, you know, innovators, as inventors, they made tons of money off of Dungeons & Dragons. And then again, because this is an American story, TSR then lost a whole bunch of money. Uh, and eventually went under in the 80s, but the thing of it is, is that D&D &D has still lived on through a Saturday morning cartoon show, through movies, books, and five editions of the role-playing game. Uh, by the way, 3.5 is the best edition, even though it's broken as hell. Now, D&D &D had a huge impact on the fantasy genre, uh, mostly because it pulled a lot from the fantasy genre to begin with. Uh, obviously, the elves and dwarves and hobbits, sorry, halflings, were obviously taken from J.R.R. Tolkien. Now, the game drew from a lot of other lesser-known fantasy writers as well, uh, guys I should have mentioned in earlier episodes but kind of forgot. For example, the magic system is taken straight from Jack Vance's Dying Earth novels, or... The whole thief character class is the Grey Mouser, one of uh, Fritz Lieber's most popular swords and sorcery characters. Now, the 1979 Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide has something called Appendix N, which lists all of the inspirational material, or at least some of the inspirational material, that they're pulling from. So it's right there between a monster summoning chart and the encumbrance of standard items. Now... The thing that D&D did for the fantasy genre was it helped it spread in popularity. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, the whole nature of D&D, &D, in which the dungeon master creates a new dungeon and a new story for each game, it's, uh, it's pretty much training wheels for the aspiring fantasy author. Uh, and so that is why in the 80s you see a lot of uh, fantasy novels which were either, you know, Dungeons and Dragons novels explicitly, like in the work of uh, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, or they were pretty much, again, Dungeons and Dragons with the serial numbers filed off. Looking at you, Raymond E. Feist. But there were a lot of other influences on the fantasy genre at the time. Uh, 1977 saw the release of Terry Brooks's The Sword of Shannara. Uh, it's, again, The Sword of Shannara is basically uh, a Xerox of the Lord of the Rings, uh, down to the part where the mysterious wizard mentor falls down a hole while battling an even evil demon thing in a horrible dungeon, only to come back later. Uh, incidentally, the Silmarillion, uh, a history of Middle-earth based on J.R.R. Tolkien's notes, organized by his son, also came out in 1977. Now, the thing is, Terry Brooks's book was stupidly popular. It sold 125,000 copies in just one month. This proved to the publishing companies that there was an audience out there for new, if occasionally derivative, fantasy. So this set the template for what we see today. Anytime you go to a bookstore and see a fantasy novel with the title of The Noun of the Made-Up Word, you have Brooks to thank. So fantasy had been a thing for as long as we've told stories. The Brooks model of doorstopper trilogies uh, is pretty much what we read today. 1977 would be a banner year in the genre for the books I've already mentioned alone. But on the film side of things, something came out that would come to define what we see as science fiction today. I am, of course, talking about Star Wars, Episode Four: A New Hope. So, Star Wars, I'm not going to go into it too deeply. You've seen it, you know it. Uh, there's lots of other people on YouTube talking about it. But, again, just goes to show the appetite people had for science fiction and fantasy. And this near insatiable desire for more material, more stories, whether they were about elves and dwarves, or whether they were about people in spaceships with laser swords, 
people wanted to read it and watch it and even play it in the role-playing games. And so we would see in the 1980s a real blossoming of the genre and a lot of new subgenres beginning to rise. And I'm going to explore a lot of those next episode.